Whose side is Kate really on? How is everything going to affect season 4 of The Boys? While some questions have been answered in the season finale of Gen V, others remain a mystery. Warning, spoilers ahead. Throughout the first six episodes of Gen V, the show seemed surprisingly self-contained. Sure, you've got some cameos from The Deep and some stray mentions of Homelander being on trial, but for the most part, it felt like a small-scale conspiracy taking place in a fairly closed-off school. You didn't have to watch The Boys to understand it, and vice versa. This all shifted at the end of Episode 6, which revealed that Dean Indira Shetty has been plotting to build a virus that will wipe out all of the soups. Is there any risk of us getting sick? No, no, none at all. The virus only affects soups. It attaches to the compound in their blood. Immediately, the implications became clear. If she succeeded, this would have massive repercussions throughout the boys. Not only could it mean the death of bad soups like Homelander or The Deep, it would mean the demise of Starlight and Kimiko as well. Still, for most of the sixth episode, Jumanji, it seemed like the show would stay relatively self-contained, with the core characters reeling from the reveal that Kate had been betraying them and wiping their memories. Jumanji seemed to serve the clear narrative purpose of getting the gang back together. The other characters learned Kate's backstory and were forced to confront their own sins in the process. By the end of the episode, the direction for the rest of the season seemed clear. Kate would redeem herself and, win or lose, they'd all band together for the finale, likely preserving the status quo for the boys in the process. Of course, those next two episodes weren't so simple. Episode 7, Sick, ramped things up even more, with Congressman Victoria Newman coming to campus. If elected, our administration wants to put a new position in government that allows the superhuman community to have a seat at the table. For fans of The Boys, her interactions with Marie, not to mention her actions at the campus town hall, were delightful to watch. Still, there's something a little disappointing about how such a major plot point was wrapped up by a character from another show. Sick took the issue of what to do about the virus out of Marie's hands. Marie, however, is our main character. It would have been nice to see how she would have handled it on her own. Gen V may have introduced some fascinating new characters, but in the end, the show isn't really about them. With Newman taking her own secret dose of the virus and the Soup Lives Matter crowd spiraling out of control, it became clear throughout the penultimate episode that the season's main purpose is to set up season 4 of The Boys. The finale, Heroes of Godalkin, makes this even more blatant, with both Homelander and Ashley showing up to play major roles. Things get more muddied with the lack of resolution. The season's final moments involve Kate and Sam getting praised by the press thanks to Homelander, whereas Marie, Andre, Jordan, and Emma are all demonized and locked away. For how long? We don't know. It seems insane that they trapped them in there for the entirety of Season 4, which means we might end up getting a Mandalorian Book of Boba Fett situation, in which a cliffhanger in one show is resolved in another. Of course, this is the trade-off with having a small spin-off show that's part of a larger, ongoing series. Gen V was always going to have to choose between staying self-contained or sacrificing its larger sense of continuity for the sake of the franchise. Maybe it's good that instead of attempting a nearly impossible juggling act, they opted to firmly choose the latter over the former. Now we know, more clearly than ever, that Gen V is not a self-contained thing. There's some relief in the show no longer treading that awkward middle ground. It helps that Gen V offers up a fun subversion of a classic superhero dynamic in the process. In the finale, our group of soups have splintered off into two camps, those who believe peaceful coexistence with non-soups is possible, and those who don't. On the anti-peace side of things is Kate, whose powers are strikingly similar to Professor X from the X-Men franchise. She can both control people's minds and read them. It's a power that might not seem that dangerous at first glance, especially if you're an X-Men fan who's used to Xavier using the power with good intentions, but it quickly made her one of the scariest soups on the show. At first blush, the obvious Magneto of the pro-peace group is Andre, who can bend metal. But if anything, the Magneto parallel here is Marie. She's another bender with a traumatic early childhood that informs her motivations, and she's most strongly positioned as Kate's main foil. With its final episode, Jin V asks what would have happened if Xavier and Magneto had switched places. What if X-Men First Class, which also focused on a bunch of young adult superhumans, had made Xavier the bad guy instead? Like X-Men, 
Gen V ultimately takes the stance that peaceful coexistence between soups and regular humans should be the end goal. Much like how Magneto in The Last Stand is clearly painted as being in the wrong for trying to murder every single non-mutant near the end, Dean Shetty is portrayed as going too far with their soup-killing virus. Both franchises insist that genocide is never the answer. But the worlds of these franchises are different and this argument also plays a little differently between them. After all, the X-Men movies portray mutants as a thinly-veiled metaphor for vulnerable minority groups. The 2000s films in particular were clearly focused on the gay rights parallel. It's why so much of The Last Stand focuses on the misguided creation of a cure for being a mutant, and why X2 gives us a scene with Bobby and his parents that plays out almost exactly like a coming-out scene. Realize we still love you, Bobby. It's just… This mutant problem is a little… What mutant problem? But the series always strained a bit under this metaphor, because the mutants in the X-Men movies aren't legitimately dangerous. There are a lot of reasons why real-life homophobia is bad, but a big one is simply that queer people aren't actually a danger to anyone. But it's hard to blame anyone who's watched Magneto casually destroy the Golden Gate Bridge for concluding that mutants truly are a serious threat. Nor is it easy to blame Huey for hating soups after one of them accidentally exploded his girlfriend. Gen V, meanwhile, exists in a franchise that treats its superhuman characters more as powerful privileged elites, not a persecuted minority. The Boys, at its core, has always been an anti-cop show. As the sudden prevalence of the Soup Lives Matter slogan in Season 3 made clear, the best real-world parallel for these soups is the police. Most of the soups we meet are crime fighters who are rarely held accountable for their actions, are passively excused by the press, incapable of properly owning up to their mistakes, and will regularly indulge in revenge fantasies and cozy up to white supremacy. Even the good soups like Starlight and Queen Maeve are characters who basically play the role of disillusioned cops, who have repeatedly tried and failed to change a broken system from within. I really did want to make a difference. I really did care. I was just like you." So when the college soups in Gen V start complaining about how they're a persecuted minority during Victoria Newman's debate, it rings a little hollow. The most prominent character among them is Rufus, a campus date rapist, after all. The soups trapped in the woods might genuinely be mistreated, but these Homelander fans cheering on soup power are not one of them. They're a parody of white conservatives as the show's left-wing writers see them. People who have it all, who genuinely think they're better than everyone else, yet still have the nerve to self-righteously declare themselves victims. You will not replace us! It's a lot easier to see Kate's rampage in the season finale as villainous in this context. After three seasons of The Boys and one season of Gen V, it feels like, if anything, most soups in this universe have been treated far too leniently. Most of them aren't persecuted minorities, they're a powerful group of people who've got most of the media and corporations on their side. But as Gen V has made abundantly clear, the situation is a little more complicated than that. For every Andre out there who can accidentally slice a woman's neck at a bar and walk away from it with zero consequences, there's a soup like Sam who spent his whole childhood being tortured and imprisoned for things mostly out of his control. Even Homelander, who has served as the perfect argument for why the ultra-powerful soups should never have been made at all, is still the way he is because of how horrifically he was treated in his early childhood. He may be the epitome of entitlement now, sure, but in his early years, he was denied a lot of basic human rights. Likewise, both Kate and Sam, the two characters who have come out most strongly in favor of Soup's rights, are the two who have been wronged the most. Kate was rejected by her parents for powers she had no control over, powers that her parents gave her without her knowledge or permission. Sam's motivations are obvious. He's been mistreated into near insanity for years, and even having a widely beloved older brother wasn't enough to spare him. Although the franchise has made it clear that soups in this universe genuinely need more government restrictions in order to keep everyone safe, the treatment of both Kate and Sam was genuinely terrible. Like Magneto before them, their motives are perfectly understandable even if their actions are clearly over the line. The finale's last few moments have Homelander swooping down and settling things the way he wants to. That means Kate and Sam are being paraded as heroes, and the pro-soup movement is now stronger than ever. It's tragic, because as sympathetic as Kate and Sam's motives might be, we know that their cause will almost certainly be overshadowed by Homelander's self-serving fascist ideology. We don't know how much Kate and Sam will get to interact with Homelander in The Boys Season 4, but it's easy to picture them both growing disillusioned with the cause the more they interact with the guy. 
As much as some soups might genuinely be a persecuted minority in this universe, Homelander's Soup Lives Matter movement has clearly been a metaphor for the alt-right from the very beginning, and it's not clear if Kate will be down with that for very long. There's also something particularly tragic about Sam's development, as he is introduced to this group of Homelander fanboys at the worst possible time. After a lifetime of being tortured for who he is, Sam is introduced to a guilt-free, celebratory way of living, one without any of the complications involved with Emma's more nuanced, non-genocidal approach. Kate using her powers to make him feel nothing about the destruction he's causing is particularly fitting, as this is the approach that Homelander's philosophy basically requires. Like any hate movement founded on the demonization of other people, its followers pretty much have to cut themselves off from any self-reflective emotions to continue doing what they're doing. By asking Kate to take away his guilt, he's actively taking part in the willful blindness towards human suffering that so many hate movements are built upon. The big question Guardians of Godalkin refuses to address is exactly what went down with Kate and Shetty in the penultimate episode. In Sick, we saw the two talk for a bit, and it genuinely seemed like Shetty had won Kate back over to her side. She said, One last push from you, and then we can leave all of this behind. But the next time she and Kate were on screen, things were completely different. Kate mentally forced Shetty to explain everything to the others, and then she forced Shetty to slit her own throat right in front of them. It's an action that mostly makes sense given what we've seen of the character so far, but it still feels like something's missing. It feels like we've skipped the scene between the two that fills in this gap. We just don't know what it is. The fandom was filled with theories over the week-long wait, like how maybe Shetty wasn't dead, and that Kate had simply given everyone else a fake vision. The finale doesn't address these theories at all, which makes us wonder if they're holding on to some big Shetty-related reveal for a later date. Maybe this is one of those Snape kills Dumbledore situations, and Kate is furthering Shetty's agenda while pretending to be on the opposite side. After all, if anything could convince Vought and the government to see the wisdom in wiping out the soups like Shetty wants, the events at Galdakan University in this episode would certainly be it. Kate might seem like this universe's Magneto with Professor X's powers, but the Gen V finale still leaves the possibility of her character being even more complicated than that.